Hey y'all, welcome back for more Bio 370. It's summer 2023, week number three. Topic number four, which deals with sex linkage. So when we look at just genes in general, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that they're found on things that we call chromosomes. There's a thing that exists, a type of picture that's called a karyotype, and it's a complete set of all the chromosomes that you turn out to have. We actually use what we would call the metaphase chromosome because that's going to be the most compact. It's the easiest to manipulate. And we can identify these chromosomes based upon banding patterns that they turn out to have, and there's some size similarities too. And what we see is like chromosome 1 looks similar. Uh, let's make it a different color. And chromosome 2 looks similar, and chromosome 3 looks similar. And we can do this all the way through chromosome 22. And then where we should only see a difference is this ending where we happen to have either two that will look the same or two that will look very different from each other. Our karyotype is going to be a 2n equals 46, 46, meaning our diploid number is 46 chromosomes. 22 pairs of these chromosomes are going to look the same no matter where we look. So it doesn't matter who we pluck these out of, we should see 1 through 22 being the same. It's going to be the ending bit, like I pointed out, that's going to be different. If they turn out to look the same, meaning all 23 pairs look the same, we call it being homogametic. And if at the very end we see a difference, we call that being heterogametic. So in short, XX is what we would call being homogametic. XY is what we would call being heterogametic. Here's a better way of looking at the chromosomes. So again, this is this karyotype would be a 46XY because I see... 2 of each through 22, then I see an... Actually, sorry, this is actually not that at all. I am wrong. This is a 45XO, which is a condition that we'll talk about next week called Turner Syndrome. But what you'll notice is we have these, like, patterns on the chromosomes. And we can use these patterns to identify the chromosomes. And in fact, because of these patterns, they actually can stain differently... So they have different colorations, so that's why we call these things chromosomes. Because chromosome, chrome is color, and some is body. So these are bodies that are colored. We know that genes are on chromosomes due to the work of two individuals. The one who got famous for it, which is Thomas Hunt Morgan, and then the one who actually did the work, which is his one of his grad students, Alfred Sturvant. They worked with a model organism referred to as Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly, and they looked at the relationship between genes and chromosomes. And what they noted, they were the first to note that, hey, there are some chromosomes that seem to show up regardless of the sex of the fly, and they dubbed those chromosomes autosomes. And then they had chromosomes that seemed to differ based upon the sex of the fly, and they called those sex chromosomes. So in our case, 1 through 22 would be deemed to be autosomes. The X and Y chromosomes we would call the sex chromosomes. There are diseases that are actually linked to each of these chromosomes. So this figure here, which is not particularly amazing to read, but still points it out nonetheless. Like hemophilia is found on the X chromosome. Male infertility is found on the Y chromosome. Early onset Parkinson's is found on chromosome 1. Um... Cystic fibrosis is found here on chromosome number 7, things like that. When we look at traits, we can have traits that are found on autosomes, and we can have traits that are found on the sex chromosomes. Well, for mammals, like the sex chromosomes look really different. So the, like the X chromosome is really big, and the Y chromosome is really small. If I were to draw these as metaphase chromosomes... And the question is, well, they have to be able to pair up. And how do they do that? And the answer is, their very tips, which I know is going to be kind of awkwardly shown here, but these tips near where we happen to have the telomeres, these also contain what we call a pseudo-autosomal region. And these pseudo-autosomal regions allow for these two to pair up during meiosis. In reality, what you'd see something is kind of like this. 
it kind of pairs up like this, where you have the X chromosome that kind of folds over and the Y chromosome doesn't have to do too much. But we get our pairing, nonetheless. Because the X chromosome is so big and it's found in all organisms, clearly there's a lot more X-linked genes than there are on the Y chromosome, or what we would call Y-linked genes. And by linked, we mean that's where these genes are found. So, of course, with us, um, us being mammals, females would have two Xs and males have one X. This is, of course, following the main pattern of things. Because, again, remember that genetics is bimodal. It's not binary in this particular case. So if you turn out to have two X chromosomes as opposed to someone who has one, this leads to a problem. And the catch is you get twice as much gene product from the X chromosomes as you would if you have two Xs than if you only have one. So how, how do you compensate for that? How do we deal with some people get twice as much X gene as other people? The human or the mammal answer is what we call... X chromosome inactivation, where literally we shut off one X chromosome. And we are aware of this because of cats. So the calico cat and the tortoise shell cat have these weird splotchy patterns. And the reason for that is the coloration is found on the X chromosome. So if these cats turn out to have two different colors, depending on which chromosome you're looking at, and depending on which chromosome we inactivate and where, we get these splotchy patterns, like the calico pattern or the tortoise shell pattern. Like I said, both of these are the result of X chromosome inactivation. Here's showing you those that pseudo-autosomal region found on the X chromosome and on the Y. And it turns out, I pointed out to you at the start of class that it's possible to be an XX male and be an XY female. And the reason for that is recombination can exist between the pseudo-autosomal regions. And SRY is right next to the pseudo-autosomal <laughs> excuse me, region on the male chromosome. These are cells that are exhibiting X chromosome inactivation. So this dark splotchy thing that you see right here is actually inactivated um, DNA. So this one here turns out to be what we call a bar body. And this is a nice way of saying an inactivated X chromosome. There are more than one way to make this happen. So, again, we happen to have the mammal answer. So the mammalian answer is let's just randomly knock out one of these X chromosomes. And when you do that, it makes XX and XY similar to each other. Another potential answer is how about if you're XY, let's double the amount of output that you get from your X chromosome. So the X chromosome works twice as hard if you're XY than you would if it's XX. This is actually what fruit flies do. We can also happen to have the issue of, well, what if you don't follow this type of pattern? Like the nematode C. elegans, they turn out to be either XX or X0, meaning they either have one or two X chromosomes and that's it. So what they do is they cut each of their XX chromosome, so each X of the XX chromosome, in half. So we actually get a halving, kind of like what we sort of kind of do. So there's lots of different ways to answer this. So we can either inactivate, we can double, or we can half it. When we look at different organisms, their sex chromosomes will differ. Now, when I say this, I'm referencing animals. 
when it comes to plants, there are th such things as sex chromosomes, but they don't function the way they do in animals. So we're going to ignore that. So this is an animal phenomenon, the way I'm describing it here. So with mammals, males are typically XY and females are XX. And again, I said typically. But if I look at birds, birds, the males turn out to be ZZ and females are ZW. So it's the opposite. So in males, male mammals, the males are homogametic, while the females are, sorry, males are heterogametic, while the males are homogametic. But if we look at birds, males are homogametic, and the females are heterogametic. If I look at insects, they're all over the place. Lepidopterans, so these are butterflies and moths, well, they follow the bird pattern. If I look at the dipterans, so these are flies, they follow the mammal pattern. If I look at Hymenoptera, so these are stinging animals, so these are the ones that sting you, they do the XX or the XO. That's kind of like the C. elegans, so the flatworm. They're either two X's or there's only one X. This here turns out to be the platypus genome, looking at its sex chromosomes. And with us, well, with the platypus, there are um, five X chromosomes and five Y chromosomes. So a male would be X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, which is so weird especially because all of the X chromosomes have nothing to do with the rest of the mammals, and the Y chromosomes have nothing to do with the rest of the mammals. They actually match other chromosomes, which is really, really weird. We also start to see some pleiotropic traits in here. So I pointed out last time about the white eye mutation in Drosophila. So what we can do is if I were to take a red-eyed female and cross it with a white-eyed male, for the F1, all of the females are going to be red-eyed and all the males oops, are also going to be red eyes. So we get nothing but red eyes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross the F1 generation. So F1 cross F1. So we're going to make the males and females mate. And what I tend to see is I can get a whole bunch of females who are red-eyed, and then the males turn out to be split between red eyes and white eyes. So this here is like, a wait, this doesn't follow any type of normal um, pattern. And that's because the white eye allele is sex-linked, which is a very nice way of saying it's on the X chromosome. I pointed out that it's pleiotropic before because there's some other things that happen too. So it turns out the white eye mutation makes it so that the male or the individual who has white eyes is not as successful at living. So it's not particularly great to have the white eye mutation. Okay, so we have this pattern here. How do I know that it's sex-linked? So I made a proposal that it's sex-linked, but like, how can I demonstrate it? The way I can do that is using something referred to as a reciprocal cross. So what we mean by a reciprocal cross is we're just going to keep the phenotypes the same, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to swap the sexes. So what I mean by that is the first time red-eyed female, white-eyed male. So now we're going to switch it so it's a white-eyed female and a red-eyed male. If it is autosomal, so if it's autosomal, which is all the crosses that we've been doing before, we should get the same answers. But if it's not, meaning if it's sex-linked, I should get different outcomes. 
what do we see? Well, already, you know, the females are going to have red eyes, the males are going to have white eyes. Already we're off. And now when I look at the offspring, you're going to get half the females with red eyes, half with white eyes, half the male offspring with red eyes, half the male offspring with white eyes for the F2. And because these data do not match each other, we would say, ha ha, I know that there's sex linkage going on. The main reason for this is the male is hemizygous. So if the male had the normal eye color, it would look like this. But if the male had the white eye color, it would be that. So this would be normal, and this would be the white eye color. And that's enough to throw things off. This obviously can play out looking at it in terms of chromosomes, which is what we're showing here. So typically, whenever we're dealing with a cross that deals with sex linkage, what you need to do is you actually put your chromosome or you put your trait on the chromosomes themselves. So like for cross A, if we had the normal eye color cross with the white-eyed male, it would look like this. Whereas in cross B, we had that combination. And when you run through your crosses in order to get to the F1 offspring, when you fill out the Punnett square, it would fill out the exact same way. So this one here would give you... Oh, it's not letting me... Ugh. That's what I get for writing near the edge. So I either get that combination or I get that combination. So no matter what, normal-eyed female, normal-eyed male. If I look over here, I would get a normal-eyed female or I get a white-eyed male, which is what I saw. And then you let these cross and you get all these offspring. Sex link traits are virtually exclusively found on the X chromosome in mammals, and that's because it is insanely rare to have Y link traits. Um, there was an article that just came out a few years ago, which is this one right here, dealing with this trait here, which deals with a gene called TBL1Y, and this is a, dream, a gene that's associated with hearing loss. It also is associated with some prostate problems, and they think it's Y-linked. It's a relatively easy paper to access, so you can look at it if you wanted to, but it walks through, here are the steps that they would go through to demonstrate this is why we think this is a Y-linked disorder. There are many famous sex-linked traits, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this one here is your muscles don't actually contract when you tell them to. Or, excuse me, they do, but they don't respond the way you think. Male pattern baldness is sex-linked. Hemophilia, at least classic hemophilia, is sex-linked. Hypertrichosis, which is having too much hair, turns out to be one of these. Um, so whenever we do problems that are sex-linked, what you always need to keep in mind is the organism that you're using. Because birds do not inherit the same way as mammals do. So, for example... So here, uh, in chickens, beak color is controlled by a sex-linked gene. So chickens are birds, so that means ZZ is going to be male, and female will be ZW. Dark beaks are dominant to light beaks. Okay, so um, dominant to light. A female with a dark beak mates with a male with light beak. So the female would be this, and the male would need to be this. In the F1, the female have light beaks and the males have dark. So here's my parental. Here's my F1. So if I were to cross this, obviously the male can only give up Z little d. The female can give up either a Z with a capital D or a W. So we're told that the females have light beaks, that's what we see here. 
So this would be light female, and the males have dark beaks. Diagram the P and F1 crosses using genetic symbols and clearly show an organized way genotype for the F2. So if I could get these birds to mate with each other, what would we get for the F2? So because this is weird, I'm going to actually put it down as a Punnett square. So hopefully it can make it so it's easier for you to see. I'm going to color code it. So we have those two here. So I took the male broke it up. Then we'll take the female and break up her chromosomes. And I'm just going to fill in the Punnett square using my colors. So obviously everything on the top row is going to be male, everything on the bottom row is going to be female. And what do I see? I see a quarter of the offspring are going to be light and male. I see a quarter of the offspring are going to be dark and male. I see a quarter of the offspring are going to be light and female. And a quarter of the offspring oh, are going to be light and female. If you don't see where those are coming from, let me try and make it easier by associating each of these claims with a box. So these problems aren't hard, they just look different. And it's a game of practice, and we will do lots of practice in class. The next topic that we're going to look at is pedigree analysis, which is let's start putting everything together, but now we're just going to look at people.